today is not going to be a workshop so much like the last two uh, ones I did. Um, this is going to be more focused on um, just the higher level concepts. And when we're thinking about DAP architecture, like there's a lot of ways to build products and services on blockchains. So I'm not going to get too much into the details about how to um, like use the tools, but I'm kind of going to kind of give an overview of like what the landscape looks like and then how to think about architecting different aspects of your DAP. Um, so yeah, with that, we'll go over to like, we'll go over some architecture diagrams um, to see how other people have thought about building DAPs. Cause like Alon said, when you guys are um, solving problems and thinking about the problems you're having, like you're not alone. Like a lot of other people have similar problems. They may be building a different product, but the design space is similar. And one thing I love about the crypto space is people share a lot um they publish their findings and like everybody's learning from everybody else whether that's smart contract development dap design um so if you're kind of like stuck on something reach out to people or start doing research and um throughout this presentation i'll give some references to other dapps that are like i think just referencing how other dapps do things is a really good way to figure out how to solve the problems you're seeing um so yeah we'll go over some diagrams go over like how users are interacting with Celo to get a sense of those touch points, um, what the on-chain actions look like from the user perspective, um, off-chain storage options from uh, the developer perspective. And then I wanna touch on some smart contract architectures that can help you think about, um, yeah, things that can be important to cover early on that'll make your life easier down the road as you grow your product. So with that, we'll jump into, um, yeah, just a high level diagram of what a simple DAP architecture can look like. Um, so on the bottom right here, we have, or on the whole right side of the diagram here, we actually have like a similar architecture to what we'd see in like traditional web development where we just have a UI on a client computer, um, like the user is interacting with their device, whether it's mobile or desktop. Um, and then on the top right, there'll be like traditional app services like a a server serving a web page, um, potentially connected to a database that's serving user data. Um, these things are more optional in DAP design because you can have just like data stored on the blockchain, but it's very common for a lot of DAPs to have um, traditional web services backing their application just to provide quality user experience. Um, it really just makes things fast and easy and intuitive. So people coming, um, people are getting an experience that they, they expect when interacting on the web. Um, but like these traditional web services will interact with the blockchain for doing certain things. Um, generally those things are related to um, things that need to be like secure, consistent and like um, trustless in the sense that it's gonna be storing sensitive information where um, Ideally, things stored on the blockchain will be related to like value transfer, like using cryptocurrency or tokens or governance or voting, um, which also ties into identity. So like a heuristic I use is like um, identity and like value claims should be stored on the blockchain. And, and you can think about putting everything else um, off chain in different mechanisms and there's different off chain storage options. So you don't have to use centralized services that you're running for off chain storage options, but um, and we'll get into that a bit more later. So, yeah, um, this is a good high level view. And I, one thing I do like about this diagram is it shows how um, apps are connecting to nodes, which are actually running the EVM and the smart contracts. And your app may be connected to one smart contract, but your smart contract may be talking to a whole bunch of other smart co contracts behind the scenes. So it gets, to this idea of like DAP architecture isn't just this interface app architecture with smart contracts. There's also this smart contract architecture that you have to think about early on. Um, smart contracts are immutable and they're difficult to upgrade. So you wanna do that as little as possible. So getting a, a proper smart contract architecture early on is, is super helpful. So just that's where a little bit of upfront work um, can save you a lot of time down the road. Here's another diagram that's a bit uh, simpler, easier to read. 
Um, and one thing that I like about this one is it shows that like users are interacting with dApps um, in pretty much two ways. They're either connecting to a wallet and then just using the wallet for the actions or they're connecting to a dApp, which is connecting to a wallet. So um, wallets really are like the gateways to, to the network. Um, but it, this diagram also shows that like a lot of this complexity of what's going on in your dApp is abstracted away from the user. So that's to the user's benefit. The users don't want to or need to know necessarily um, how this all works, but just keeping in mind that like these two touch points are really, really it for when your users are interacting with it or with interacting with your product or the blockchain. So um, once they're connected to the wallet, um, wallets are connecting to public nodes, backend services to make data retrieval faster um, and node software that's uh, actually communicating with smart contracts. So um, this architecture is relevant for most blockchains. I mean, I've been focused on Ethereum based blockchains and um, this is a kind of the pattern that we've seen seen throughout. I'm sure some of the newer blockchains that have different architectures um, have some different design patterns, but this is a really good high level view. So. So when you're thinking about DAP architecture, there's architecture choices for the front end and architecture choices for the back end. Um, front end architectures are typically designed around providing quality user experience. So like providing uh, fast data lookup um, when users do actions, um, they're letting users know that something's happen, happening instead of just like um, blockchains are asynchronous network, networks, right? So like when you send a transaction, you don't know how long it's going to take for a transaction to be mined. Um, instead of just sitting there with a blank screen waiting for a transaction to show up and then um, updating a balance, like let a user know that, hey, your transaction's pending. It can take X number of seconds. Um, and then when that actually happens, show a pop up and say, hey, your transaction's completed. You guys might have seen this on some of the um, wallets you've used on, on other blockchain networks. Um, it's also current, currently used on um, the Celo extension wallet. But yeah, front end architectures are mainly around that user experience side of things. Um, back end architectures are designed around data storage costs and access. Um, so, storing data on blockchains is expensive relative to other ways of storing data. So data that you don't need to store on a blockchain you probably shouldn't also there's like visibility concerns around data going on a blockchain can be viewed and read by anyone um, so encrypting data and then thinking about who can decrypt the data and how you're going to share that access um, is important to think about very early when you're in the design process um, Yeah, so as you like storing data on ch chain, like on the back end, um, makes it really accessible because any other smart contract can then read um, data, other data that's stored in smart contracts. But so it makes it more accessible. Um, but like I said, it gets more expensive as you um, store more data on chain. So you have to weigh the trade offs of like accessibility, visibility, um, and cost for users because ultimately users are going to be paying the cost of um, updating contracts typically, depending on how your, your DAP is designed. So I wanna to touch a bit on um, going into the front end and just thinking about how like your DAPs are talking to Celo. And as I mentioned, uh, users are interacting with the blockchain through two channels, either wallets directly or DAPs, which are connecting to wallets. Um, and wallets really are the gateway for average users to interact with the blockchain. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I want to keep this, this higher level and just talk about like the different interface points and not go into the implementation, implementation details too much. Um, so if you have any questions or concerns about like your architecture design or how you're thinking about it, or you just want to like chat with me later on about specific questions you have, um, feel free to reach out and, um, yeah, when you're thinking about how users are going to be interacting with your DAP, 
I think it would be really useful to actually consider what wallets you might consider your users. Um, like what will you suggest, what wallets will you suggest your users use? Um, maybe Valor if they're on mobile devices, it may be Celo Terminal if they're on desktops and you have a React app. Um, so I think thinking about this like suggested wallet um, can be really helpful for thinking about how your user interface will be designed and then how your front end architecture will actually be designed. Um, that being said, anybody should be able to use any wallet to interact with your DAP. Um, even if you suggest that people are using Valora, they may want to use another mobile DAP or they may want to use a, a desktop wallet. Um, so considering how other wallets are going to be interacting with your DAP um, is, is good early on. Like don't just test everything with Valora because when other people, when other wallets like are like becoming more popular in the ecosystem, um, it may cause some some problems down the road just because there's some nuances with every dApp and every wallet and how they're interacting with each other. Um, so consider these like multiple multiple avenues for interaction from the beginning. Um, in that vein, there's just like touching on on wallets. Um, there are two types of wallets: there are custodial wallets and non-custodial wallets. Custodial wallets are wallets that are managed by like a third party for a user. Um, so a third party is holding private keys for the users and then maintaining the, the user's balance um, and basically performing actions on the network for them. Um, so the responsibility for security and uptime is on the custodian. And this allows for like, there's a trade off here where like you're trusting this third party to hold um, funds for you, but you can also get a quality user experience from a service like that. Um, like I've used Coinbase before and Coinbase um, can provide a quality user experience because they don't have to wait for block times, um, that for transfers, they don't have to, um, yeah, they're not limited by the blockchain limitations underneath because they just have, a, um, have the ability to abstract all that away. Um, so the limitation there is like, there's not a lot of functionality enabled by Coinbase. Like I can't go interact with dApps really using the Coinbase interface. Um, it's really focused just like on holding and transferring funds or trading in the case of Coinbase. So examples of custodial wallets are exchanges. Like, like I said, um, also Coinbase has a custody service and Anchorage is another one. Um, but there's a, there's a host of them out there. And, and this may be, appropriate for your use case. Um, custodians are seen as like a, a trusted way to handle like large amounts of, of crypto. And I think like institutions are typically more comfortable working with custodians. So if you're like working with aid programs or um, like larger like NGOs, they may be more comfortable using custodians um, than than managing their private keys and doing their actions um, on their own because they don't want to take on that risk. Um, I know there was a question last week about working with custodial wallets. Um, if you're interested in working with custodial wallets, like I'm happy to chat, but it's going to be like on a case by case basis where I'm not familiar with how custodians are actually integrating and like how you can use their wallets and um, I would imagine that they have uh, different standards and different interfaces for each custodian. So like Anchorage and Coinbase would have different ways for um, creating wallets and then transferring funds and uh, managing things through an API. So, um, Hey, yeah. Josh, this is Rube. Um, my, my, that was my question last week. And my, my, um, my challenge was one of key management and the sort of encryption and salting of the uh, private public keys and so on. And that was kind of, but I think you've touched upon a lot of that. So yeah, I was like, my, my debate really was whether or not I should use like a key management platform of some sort or just encrypt that myself, really. Yeah, I would, if you don't have experience with it and you don't have an expert working with you on your team, like I would, it's a, it's a trade-off. Like um, I would recommend going with the professionals in their space. Like, I guess as a general recommendation for people like early on in um, developing these products is like, 
there's so many different things to learn in this space and so many different areas of expertise. Um, you guys are good at one or like a handful of things, um, but let experts in their domain, like just hire people or like work with people um, with partnerships or whatever um, to like let them like let custodians do what they do best and just like trust them because it's going to take a lot of overhead off of you in terms of like what you're going to have to pay attention to and what you're going to have to think about. Um, you're just going to be able to trust that they're providing a um, top notch service for what they're doing. Um, granted, like, yeah, it's, it's a bit more expensive, but um, I think to free up your time and energy and attention to focus on the things that, that you really need to, um, it's worth it. So on the flip side of custodial wallets, there are non-custodial wallets. Um, and non-custodial wallets are where users manage their own private keys. Um, so this, these are the wallets where you get typically get a 12 or 24 word seed phrase at the beginning for your account recovery. So if you ever lose access to your account, you can recover it in another wallet or in uh, just restore a wallet. Um, this puts the risk on, on the user in the sense of if they lose their wallet and their recovery phrase, the funds are essentially inaccessible. Um, so it is riskier, but there are advantages like you can avoid compliance issues associated with money transmitter laws because you're just letting people do this on their own. You're not facilitating the transfer of money. Um, also, there's much more flexibility in user interaction. When users have access to their own private keys, they can sign any arbitrary data, whether it's a transaction or an identity claim or just any, any message. Um, you can prompt them to sign that with their private key and verify who the, the user is. Whereas um, that's not really possible when you are working with a custodian, unless they specifically provide that service. Um, but with, with non-custodial wallets, there's no, you don't need permission from anybody to do, to do these actions. Um, so yeah, non-custodial wallets are, are really powerful, but um, it does take education. Like if you guys have installed Valora, um, there's a handful of education screens when you're onboarding that's just like aimed to make it easier for new users to understand kind of like the importance of this and, and how it works. So wallets need to connect to the blockchain to read account balances as well as um, send transactions that are signed by users. Uh, and this can happen through two ways. So there's self-hosted nodes where like you can actually run a cello node on your computer or you can expect your users to run nodes locally and connect to the network through their own um, nodes through like localhost um, or in the case of Valora like the cello ultralight client runs on low-end android devices and Valora can connect trustlessly to the cello network without um, relying on a, a hosted like a remote node service so um, this is a way for users to um, yeah, trustlessly connect to the network. And just a note on connecting like through local nodes, like it's typically a worse user experience in the sense of like, if I'm running a, a local node on my desktop, I actually need to install the node software, let it sync, and then route all my requests through my local node. Or in the case of Ballora, um, it's just a slower app when there's an ultralight client. Um, and even an ultralight client is still pretty uh, data intensive to run. It just takes a lot of resources on the mobile device. So there's a trade-off where you can also just connect to remote nodes, um, which is what we've been doing in the workshops the past two weeks, where you just connect to a HTTP endpoint or WebSocket endpoint, um, and you can read blockchain data through that endpoint and or send tran sign transactions through that endpoint. Um, so yeah, Figment Data Hub is what we were connecting to the past two weeks. Uh, Forno is a C-Labs run service that's similar to Data Hub. Um, so with these remote nodes, you can get a better user and developer experience, but it's a more centralized service where um, you're relying on these, these service providers. Um, and yeah, there's signal points of failure in that sense. So if you're really going for like a decentralized, um, like P2P network, throughout the stack like this this kind of like breaks that
So when we, you know, I mentioned like with wallets, wallets are doing two things, dApps are doing the same two things. They're really just listening to the Celo network events and reading contract or account state and they're sending transactions. Um, those are really the only two things that they're doing. Um, but much of the complexity of DAP front end architecture design comes from reading the state in efficient ways and creating an intuitive UX for users. Um, so reading blockchain state just from like RPC calls through a, a node endpoint, if you have a DAP that has large state or if you have contracts that have large state and a lot of activity, um, it can take a long time for the node to parse all this data and you're just it's just going to be tons of calls through the RPC endpoint. So depending on how um, you're connecting to Figment, like it can, like you're paying for usage, essentially, you're paying for your user's usage or somebody's paying Figment for user usage. Um, so I've seen architectures where they're like on the back end of like a traditional web service, um, there will just be an indexer that will watch for all the, the relevant smart contract events on the DAP contracts and then just store them in a SQL database. And then that SQL database can then serve um, the front end to users very quickly and efficiently. And it's not going to be using these like endpoint data calls. So that's that being said, um, that's like additional services that you have to set up early on um, to like provide this quality user experience. And it may not be necessary early on when you don't have a bunch of users and you don't have a giant contract state in history where there's a bunch of events. Um, so I'd say like early on in the development process, uh, you can keep it simple and you don't have to like over engineer your, your UI and your front end architecture um, because this is something that's relatively easy to update as you grow and you need to like essentially improve the UX down the road. So you can do it very simply with just like um, some basic JavaScript early on. And then as user accounts increase and your um, DAP usage increases, you can easily just add a database and then connect your UI to your database instead of uh, just reading blockchain state directly. Um, but this is just good to be aware of. Like you can keep the like MVP UI pretty simple um, and then update it as you go, which is not the case with like contracts and uh, more permanent data uh, storage options. So I, I think it's more useful to uh, put put time and attention on the back end architecture early on. Um, I just wanted to it, highlight some quality uh, DAP interfaces that do keep it very simple, like the the Mula app. Um, they were in Cell, they were in Camp last last batch um, and it only works on mobile devices so I can't log in but it's like such a basic UI um, and it's actually super useful because it's not over complicating things and it doesn't provide too much information um, to users so I recommend you guys like on your mobile devices go to app.mula.market and, and see how they do it um, it's very simple same with Ubiswap um, which is a market maker on on Celo and there's like, right from the beginning, you just see a, a simple interface where you just uh, can swap your tokens. Um, so keep it simple early on with the front end is my suggestion, um, and then build up from from there. So diving a bit more into like how you can actually read data from the network, um, whether you're building a wallet or other service, um, as I mentioned, like listening for events from contracts is a big one. Um, I have some reference code here, but you can set up a WebSocket event listener connected to a node, like even connected to Forno or uh, Figment Data Hub. And this reference code just has some JavaScript that sets up a contract event listener on the on the CUSD contract and shows how to filter events. Um, so that's one way to do it. Another way is Parsec, which was also a previous Celicamp participant. Um, they have like a they're essentially indexing all blockchain events on Celo um, and then making it accessible through their query language. Um, and then you can like set up web, web hooks and notification systems through their interface, which is really nice. Um, it would be interesting to reach out to them. I've, 
I've been chatting with them. I think they're looking at adding Cello to their free tier. It's not currently on their premium tier, but if, I think if they get some requests from current Cello campers, um, it might prompt them to to get that over there, which would be really cool. Um, but yeah, check out Parsec for, for listening for contract events. Also, you can just call RPC methods directly on a node. Um, I have the, the JSON RPC API for, if, for geth nodes linked here. Um, for Cello, there's just like a few differences related to like block difficulty and some of the proof of stake parameters. Um, but essentially the RPC API for Cello is the same as Ethereum. So this is like the a very low level way to actually just read data from, from the chain. And when you use contract kit or another like SDK that connects to a remote node, um, the SDK will be turning your request into uh, RPC API request. Um, so I just have this here for reference because um, it is a good way to do it if you're running your own node or want to just connect via RPC. And there's also the Block Scout, oops, Block Scout REST API. Um, I think I've showed this in the past where um, on the Cello Block Explorer, there's just this uh, REST API where you can actually query a bunch of information, which would be a good way to um, easily get a bunch of info about accounts, uh, contracts, transactions, just using a simple REST API. There's also a GraphQL API on Block Scout um, with a like a uh, sandbox where you can actually start querying um, information. And yeah, I'm just querying a transaction here. And um, if you're if you want to use GraphQL, um, this is another good option. So yeah, with wallets, um, a lot of wallets behind the scenes just use uh, like they import contract kit and then connect to the Celo network through a provider, um, whether that's the Celo browser extension or um, through Valora. So contract kit, like I said, is just kind of a wrapper around these RPC methods. So contract kit is a great way to just read um, read blockchain data. And then I have some reference here around querying phone numbers with Otis. Um, so you can query phone numbers. Uh, you can request that data from Valora if you are integrating with Valora, but there's also ways to just um, query phone numbers directly from a DAP, from a user. So if you want to get phone number data or account data associated with phone numbers, um, then you can use this this example code here actually is a, it's actually pretty short. It's with comments, yeah, just a, about 70 lines of code, but this will show how to connect to a remote node and just query a, a phone number, which is um, something I haven't seen in any dApps other than Valora, but I think it's a pretty powerful feature of Celo um, that would be really cool for other, other services to integrate with um, interacting with accounts that are that are linked to phone numbers. On the flip side um, of reading contract data, like dApps are also sending transactions. And as I said earlier, like this is just um, how users are going to be signing transactions with their private key, and then um, wallets will be sending them to the cell network. So just some some examples of tools that are available to do that is like Valora. Um, you can deep link to Valora with DAP kit from your DAP um, with transaction signing requests. You can connect Ledger to web apps, um, the Celo extension wallet as well. Celo wallet app for, for transfers also connects to Ledger. Um, the Celo terminal has a nice uh, interface for adding, adding DAPs and they do key management as well. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, custodial services can sign transactions on behalf of users. Like if I'm using Coinbase and I want to withdraw my funds, um, Coinbase can just send send any cryptocurrency to my personal wallets. It's usually restricted to transfers though. So I did want to uh, go a little bit into a little bit of detail about integrating with Valora because I know there were some questions about this last week. Um, so Valora is the go-to wallet for signing seller transactions on mobile devices right now. Um, and 
the suggested way for connecting to Valora is with DAPKit. We do have wallet support coming soon. There's a link to the PR right here, um, which is currently open to get it into Valora. Um, hopefully we get this merged soon in the next release of Valora. We'll have it, but um, I'm not sure exactly when it's gonna be done. But both of these services, DAPKit and Wallet Connect, are communicating with Valora via deep links. So the format of a deep link, I just included an example here um, to, because you don't technically need to use DAPKit or Wallet Connect to um, to create these deep links and connect your, your DAP to Valora. Um, you can craft deep links with whatever tools you want. Um, so Valora has a good, or DAPKit has a good reference in terms of how these deep links are crafted, but there's just a, a cello specific format for, for deep linking. Um, and yeah, essentially these deep links encode two different types of methods. So like right now, DAPKit has two methods. There's, there's one for a request account address, which is how a DAP will request for the user's account information, which includes the account address and the phone number associated with that account, if there is one. Um, and then there's another method called request TX SIG, which returns raw signed transactions. So um, your DAP will send transactions for the user to sign Valora. They'll approve the signatures in Valora. Um, and then Valora will return just the big hex encoded string of that raw transaction, which will then be broadcast to the network. Um, if you guys haven't seen it, this DAPKit truffle box has a good um, intro to how the DAPKit works. Um, so if you haven't gone through it yet and you're interested in like integrating with Valora specifically with DAPKit, I highly recommend going through this. It has examples of uh, both of these uh, both of, both of these methods in action, requesting account information and requesting transaction signatures. So that covers uh, most of the front end stuff. Um, so now I'll go into back end, back end architecture. So um, yeah, how do we think about storing data on a blockchain? Um, like what data should we even store? And as I mentioned earlier, like I, I think about it, like identity claims or, or balance changing operations are the most common ways or the most common things to store on chain. But it's really essentially anything that you want to be um, like publicly accessible, censorship resistant, um, redundant, and um, yeah, just available for people. Um, regardless of if your if your service or your interface or your DAP um, kind of goes down, like these this data behind the scenes that's on on chain will will persist. Um, and these features like come at a cost. So storing data on chain is relatively expensive and will and costs will increase as Celo becomes more popular. So um, we've seen the popularity of the cell network over the past, I think, a like week or two, we were looking at metrics the other day, um, the cost of transactions have essentially doubled over the past like two weeks. I mean, it went from like two hundredths of a cent to like four hundredths of a cent. Um, so it's still very, very small, but like there's still a market based structure for like this getting transactions in blocks and then um, updating contract state. So and these costs will increase as Celo becomes more popular. So it's important to consider how these things work um, even before Celo gets to that point. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, like dApps often leverage traditional centralized services and databases because they can afford a better user experience. They can reduce costs of keeping like of data that's not necessary to be on chain, to keep it off chain. Um, yeah, and it just helps, helps the dApp um, provide a better UX. And here's a basic example. It's um, showing Ethereum, but it just kind of highlights how some data can be stored off chain, but still be in decentralized systems to avoid censorship resistance and like avoid the single point of single point of failure problem. Um, so IPFS is the interplanetary file system, and that's a, just a distributed uh, data storage network 
Um, and we've seen like dApps in the past will either like reference IPFS data um, directly from Ethereum smart contracts um, or sell those smart contracts. And, or you just have like user data that doesn't necessarily need to be consistent at the exact same time for every user um, can also go into IPFS. Like blockchains are really good at maintaining consistency with the like pace of blocks every five seconds on Celo. Um, but on IPFS or other distributed networks, like um, things may be updated at slower paces or different paces. So people may be getting different versions of an, of an interface, like if you're storing your interface on IPFS. Um, so there's this cool idea of like store it, or like having unstoppable applications where you have a back end on a blockchain and a front end on a different uh, distributed data storage system. So there's no centralized server, centralized servers um, providing app state or app data um, to users. So, um, yeah, Josh, you know, in terms of uh, storing your, your application data, you know, there's a, a few different approaches. And one of the drawbacks to IPFS is there, it, there's a potential for the data to be lost if there's uh, too much, uh, you know, or not enough capacity on, on the network, you know, and so that, that, that creates a kind of problem for kind of redundancy. So one of the things I've been looking at for, for lighter weight assets is like doing base 64 encoding, which is expensive if you're going to store the asset directly to a blockchain because it uses all the use a lot of data, but it also creates a mechanism to, to sort of operate independently of IPFS. Do you have any thoughts on sort of redundancy and survivability of the assets? Yeah, I think it definitely depends on like what data you're storing, whether it's on IPFS or others, like I think in a couple of slides I mentioned, like there's also Filecoin and Arweave, which are like distributed data storage networks as well, but they have incentivization like layers baked in. So um, you pay for this data storage, it's still gonna be way cheaper than storing data on the blockchain, but you have some guarantees about like accessibility and um, yeah, availability when you're building on these incentivized test nets. And it's possible like to imagine that you direct some funds to this like data storage layer in your DAP architecture, like through user interaction or, or some, some mechanism that's gonna like essentially pay to keep these um, files available. Or you could just like, as your, the company could just pay for it, like your company could just pay for it early on. Um, but yeah, IPFS, you're right. Like if I'm, if I want data available on IPFS, like I'm going to pin it on my local node and I have to run a node myself and then pin it to make sure it's always available. Um, because yeah, it can just be removed from the network if it's not being accessed. Yeah, so, that's the, that's the issue that I, I, I haven't seen it, but that's what I sort of gathered is possible. Yeah, definitely possible. Um, and it's a good point of like kind of the trade-offs between the distributed networks and the leaning on centralized services um, that are just like public infrastructure at this point, essentially. Um, it takes me to like the cello metadata um, feature, which um, is currently associated with the, the accounts contract on cello, um, but this feature makes it possible to connect on-chain identities with off-chain identities. So essentially you can like register your account with the accounts contract and there's a metadata URL in that accounts um, uh, contract. So the way a lot of people are currently using it is that metadata URL is actually just a link to a GitHub um, gist. Just so the raw data includes the information that um, people want to claim is valid and that's a case where like people are leaning on GitHub as a centralized service provider, but you're getting like very like strong guarantees about like availability of that. Um, yes, if GitHub goes down, then that data will no longer be available. But um, if GitHub goes down, there's gonna be a lot of other problems as well. So um, it's a trade-off that you have to think about depending on like what your service is and how you need, like how censorship resistant it needs to be. and um, just everything, all, the, all these trade-offs that you have to think about as you're um, designing this. But it, it is currently, um, there are many people that are currently just relying on centralized service providers because it's much more convenient. Um, so 
yeah, this metadata feature is also like a cool thing to think about using for your own DAP. Um, it may or may not make sense, but some current use cases include uh, presenting public data supplied by validators for election purposes. So like validators have verified like their website URLs through this, this process. Um, also like governance tools for the governance process that show data about the governance proposals. And so making this um, like particularly data around like who is proposing certain uh, governance proposals and information around the participants in that. Um, wallets could also present data about dApps to users to increase trust. So um, you can associate any metadata URL with a um, with any account and whether that's a smart contract account or not. And um, yeah, you can think about different ways to um, build trust with users through that. And I just wanted to show how the Cello Validators Explorer is currently using this. Um, this Validators Explorer uh, shows the current validator set and all of their votes. Um, but currently, you can see this, I think it's this check mark. Yeah, this check mark indicates that um, they've, this is their metadata URL that they've verified on chain with their associated accounts. So I can, I can be sure that this website is associated with this validator. Um, so it just helps build trust with users and like, in a, in a trustless way where you can um, just know information about users or about accounts, um, on chain accounts through this uh, metadata and accounts contract. Um, the reference here is it's actually defined in CIP Cello Improvement Proposal 3. Um, so yeah, you can go there and, and learn, learn more about it. We're actually working on um, expanding this to include metadata about transactions, which would be very cool. Um, so we can have essentially off-chain claims about on-chain transactions, um, which will open up a lot of uh, cool use cases. Um, yeah, this is just showing the accounts struct in the accounts uh, contract where we essentially have um, this last bit, the last string metadata URL can be associated with the account. There's also additional information around encryption keys um, and approved signers. So you can have accounts signing on behalf of other accounts. So there's, there's some cool stuff you can do with, with identities and, and smart contract claims. Um, yeah, this goes into a bit more detail about uh, the distributed off-chain storage options that we were t talking a bit about earlier and the the idea of like building unstoppable applications that uh, can't be taken down just by shutting down a server um, and just yeah a warning about not only can data be lost here but like this is a less mature ecosystem like around these all of these platforms they're relatively new um, compared to more traditional web services so we, i mentioned ipfs um, OrbitDB is a database built on IPFS. Um, so it's a P2P database, which is pretty interesting. Um, if you build on this, like you'll want to host a copy of it yourself so you can have, be sure that this will not be uh, taken down, but um, making this distributed helps it maintain censorship resistance. Um, and I mentioned Filecoin and Rwe, which are two projects that have actually have incentive incentivize layers um, for for hosting data. So you don't have to necessarily host all this data yourself. You can just pay node operators to do it for you. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about token management and this gets into smart contract architecture. Um, so we've seen smart contracts that can be used to manage funds or tokens on behalf of groups of users. Um, we've, we see this in Celo actually with um, the reserve, I guess. The reserve is basically managing giant pools of cryptocurrency um, on behalf of the entire Celo ecosystem. Um, and this is essentially a giant honeypot. Like if somebody can hack into the reserve and, and start stealing crypto, that would be bad. So there are ways to um, reduce risk around this um, and make it more secure. And this is an architecture pattern, like you guys may have heard of multi-sig wallets, um, multi-signature wallets, where you actually need multiple people to approve 
a transaction before it will actually go through. And by people, I mean, you actually need multiple accounts. So it can be the same person or different people. Um, you can also have multi signature wallets that are controlled by other smart contracts, um, like in the cello governance contracts, the cello governance contract actually controls um, some parameters in the reserve. It controls smart contract upgrades, like some very, very core important infrastructures controlled by the governance contract. And that's not controlled by one, one person. Um, talk a bit about that in a little bit, but um, it's just good to be aware that like, if you guys are designing DAOs or systems where there's like governance or um, voting or just like managing community funds, um, you can have, you can set up these systems like early on where they have uh, re basically fail safes where um, one person's key getting compromised won't break the system. Um, also thinking about upgradability of, of contracts as, as you want to like increase functionality. Um, just being aware that you can have smart contract accounts that can authorize certain actions on behalf of other accounts. So like going back to the accounts uh, dot sole contract, um, you can see this second variable is, has a, it's a signers struct where um, essentially a registered account can authorize other accounts to send transactions on their behalf. And this is useful um, in governance where um, you could have one private key or one account that has a bunch of cello that's voting for validators, but you want that private key in cold storage because it has a lot of cello associated with it. I can authorize a signer in a hot wallet um, to just participate in governance on behalf of that account that's in cold storage. Um, so I think that's there's a relevant consideration when you're thinking about how users are going to interact with your dApps, um, how like funds will be moving around and also like capabilities that you can afford through smart contracts. Um, I think Celo has a lot of good examples in terms of um, different architectures that you can use to uh, improve the user experience on these things. Um, just real quick, I know we're getting close on time. Um, so yeah, a bit more on contract architecture and design patterns. Um, this really influences how users will transact with your DAP. Um, if you have a bunch of contracts in different places where people need to interact with them, um, you can basically require that a user sign multiple transactions to interact with a certain system. There's also ways to wrap a bunch of transactions into a single contract where a user only needs to approve one transaction and that contract can then execute five transactions on behalf of the user. Um, so that's something to think about as you're designing your smart contracts, um, if you're designing smart contracts. Uh, additional considerations would be like access control, like who can do what in certain contracts and like making it as restrictive as possible. So only allowing people things to do things that they should be and not let um, basically locking it down. Um, there's also reference to like a withdrawal pattern for like removing tokens on behalf of a bunch of users. Um, the state machine pattern. These are both references from the solidity documentation. And then also the uh, proxy upgradable pattern, which is definitely good to talk a bit more about. Um, this is actually the pattern that is used um, for the core contracts on the Celo network. Um, like the Celo dollars contract, the Celo gold, um, or just the Celo token contract, um, their proxy contracts. Um, I think almost all of the, the core Celo contracts are proxy contracts where um, it just makes them upgradable. So the proxy contract address stays the same, and then the implementations of these contracts can actually be updated. So this ties directly into the fact that smart contract functions are immutable once the contract is deployed. So if you want to be able to change any functionality of a contract at any point in the future, you need to plan ahead to create a mechanism to be able to update your contracts. Um, so yeah, the Celo Corp uh, the Celo protocol implements this um, proxy upgradable pattern, and um, particularly in Celo governance, this is this is super important. Um, 
because the governance contract manages contract upgrades, adding new stable currencies to the protocol and modifying reserve allocations. Um, and all of these changes must be agreed upon by Celo holders. So Celo is a giant DAO where everybody that owns Celo is participating in this governance process. And then this governance contract is actually um, just pushing proposals through a predefined process. Um, and if it makes it through the process, um, there's execution that happens to actually uh, implement the changes that have been proposed. Um, and the governance process goes through like a, a quorum threshold of votes required. So um, this governance contract is essentially the owner of the proxy contracts. And then the, the governance contract can determine where the implementations implementations are. So if you guys are interested in like DAP architecture as it relates to like DAOs and governance and um, security, like I think that just looking at the cello governance contracts is a really good case study. Um, there's a lot of detail there. There's a lot of contracts and it's a pretty complex system. Um, so yeah, I know we're, we're just about out of time and I want to leave just a few minutes for, for questions. So um, made it just in time.